time once again for Community Forum, and we're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, John Henry Brown. John Henry Brown is a local criminal defense lawyer and author of a new memoir titled The Devil's Defender, My Odyssey Through American Criminal Justice from Ted Bundy to the Kandahar Massacre. John, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Well, thank you. It's an honor, actually. So start out, what was uh, the motivation in putting together your new memoir? Um, well, I just it started kind of as a journal uh, about eight, eight or ten years ago. I bought a little house in a um, fishing village in Mexico and got down there. And, you know, I don't golf and do things like that, but I, I love to walk on the beach. And so I figured I'd better do something else other than just read all day. And I started a journal, which I hadn't done for a while, but I used to journal a lot. So it started kind of as a journal. Uh, and then it took more of a book form. Uh, I never thought it would be published, to be honest with you. And in retrospect now, I think it was kind of a purge for me, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the whole Bundy scene and uh, the fact that my woman friend, the love of my life at the time, was murdered. Um, that part, <clears throat> those two parts were very difficult to write. Um, so I basically just started as a journal, never thought it would be published. and <clears throat> One thing led to another, and now it's a book. And how did you choose a career as being an attorney and a, a defense attorney? Well, the true answer is my father said I either had to work or go to law school. And that was an easy choice because uh, I actually like being a student a lot. I'd probably still be a student if I could be. <clears throat> but, um, and so I went to law school. I mean, th and the other real reason is, as you, you know from reading the book, that I was arrested in Colorado when I was going to college. Uh, I was in a very popular rock and roll band that was very successful and the Denver police did not care for us. Um, I was also very active in political matters in uh, you know, 1965 to 1969 and started an SDS chapter in Denver, Colorado. A lot of people don't know what that is. but So we were kind of on the radar for the police, I think more because of the band than politics. But So uh, one Friday night, the uh, narcotics squad and um, the Denver uh, police department came to my house arrested me for a $12 bad check, and it was clearly a put-up thing. Um, but so I ended up spending three days in jail in Denver, Colorado. I knew I could get out easier, um, but after I stopped feeling sorry for myself, I started talking to the inmates that were in there with me, and it really bothered me because it was before the Supreme Court had decided a speedy trial and what it meant, and it was before the Supreme Court uh, decided that right to counsel applied to poor people. So there were people who were the, in that holding facility that had been there for months and months and months and didn't know why they were there sometimes. They didn't have lawyers. Um, there was no speedy trial. Um, it was just a warehouse. And almost 90% of them were black or Hispanic. And that really uh, upset me a lot. And the band was about to sign a contract with Electra Records, actually, which was the biggest record company in the United States at the time the record company for the Doors and, and Big Brother and the holding company and things. And I decided not to sign the record contract and go to law school instead. So, so I, got, I went to law school because I got arrested wrongfully, basically. So that worked out for all of us. <laughs> I, I hope so. So I want to touch on, before we move on to more serious subjects, um, you had a... Uh, a crossing of paths with one of our vice presidents where you had the opportunity um, minutes away from slipping him some LSD. Can you talk about that briefly? Sure. Um, it was kind of, um, I, I guess why I started writing the journalist, I thought kind of I was like a Forrest Gump sort of person because I ended up in these odd places um, and sometimes one after another. And um, so after babysitting Jimi Hendrix uh, for two days when he was in Denver and Jim Morrison, the lead singer in The Doors, I had to babysit him for a couple of days. And so the reason I'm telling you that is that a year after that, uh, hanging around and, and Jimmy was looking to purchase things that are illegal um, and I was babysitting him and taking him around places. Um, so a year after that, I ended up landing a job in Washington, D.C. with the American Broadcasting Company on a program called Issues and Answers, which at the time was the number one Sunday um, political show. It was more popular than Meet the Press. And so I got, when I went to law school in DC, there was a, 
I needed a job. And in the jobs uh, offer place at the school, they had uh, ABC had posted something to be an intern, basically, uh, uh, at uh, ABC in D.C. just on the weekends. And I applied for that and got it. And then kind of advanced through the uh, ranks and quickly in D.C., even though I was just a weekend employee. And I ended up becoming kind of a, a minor producer of Issues and Answers along with Peggy Wheaton, who was the producer, who was the first woman uh, network news producer ever. And she was fabulous. And so my job, among other things, was to greet the guests. They were all, the whole Nixon White House, I met them all except for Nixon. Um, and all other people, Ralph Nader was on the program, and uh, uh, George Wallace, who was definitely one of the most disgusting people I've ever met. And Agnew was on a couple times during the two years I was there. And he had just trashed the anti-war protesters with his uh, alliteration, if you recall, uh, nagging nabob. Oh, yeah, I don't know what it was. but And uh, he was very vocal. <clears throat> and I was very active in the um, anti-war movement in D.C., very active and so he pissed me off so it was a live show and so i figured if i slipped in this and i made drinks for these guys these they would drink at 11 o'clock in the morning on sunday or 10 o'clock actually and um and so i knew agnew was i always knew who was going to be on the show so i knew agnew was going to be on the show that sunday and i brought in a tab of lsd and i figured if i gave it to him in his drink because he always drank i remember what he was drinking manhattan's <clears throat> excuse me um and um, so I was, because if I gave it to him when he first started drinking, which was an hour before airtime, I figured he'd be coming on with the LSD just about the time of the show. And so I really had this major decision to make. And uh, I um, opted out of uh, the idea, um, but I was close. And I recount it quite accurately in the book, actually. And um, first of all, I thought I would definitely I'd get caught. Um, and somebody, the government would probably charge me with uh, attempted murder. I'd probably still be in Leavenworth now. Uh, but really it changed my mind, uh, well, two things, and that was Peggy would get in trouble, uh, and I really adored her, and she supported my crazy ways. Uh, I got in trouble with ABC a few times with conservative politicians who didn't like my, you know, foot-and-a-half-long ponytail underneath my ABC blazer. Um, so at the last minute, I decided not to do that. Also, it would be a waste of a really good LSD, in my opinion. So. <laughs> and yet, do you ever wonder how history could have been changed had you done that? No. Uh, you know, eventually, karma came along, and you know, Spiro got in trouble and then had to resign and actually um, was charged with uh, corruption charges in Maryland. So, you know, it, it, my thought was quite juvenile, to be honest with you. But I was close. So on to a little more of a serious subject. So how was it that you landed representing Ted Bundy? Once again, um, serendipity comes to play, I guess. Um, I had worked for the governor of the state of Washington. Uh, after I went to graduate school in Chicago, which you know, you read the book, and got a degree after law school, because I love being a student. And um, it was the Ford Foundation Fellowship that was pretty prestigious, actually. And, but I wanted to come back west. I had offers to stay in New York and um, a lot of other D.C., uh, Chicago. But I'm a West Coast boy, so I wanted to come back here. And so I was working in prisons in D.C. and started a prison reform program, um, which is also recounted in the book, um, the first one in the United States for prisoners. Um, and I wrote the grant. We got the grant. We did it. So I had a lot of experience in what was called back then prisoners' rights. Now, unfortunately, there's no such thing anymore. But back then, there was, and it was developing. And so the governor, Dan Evans, who was the governor of Washington, fabulous man, fabulous governor, back when there was such thing as a progressive Republican, uh, I ended up working for him. Uh, um, I saw the ad in, at the school in Northwestern and uh, came out here, worked for the governor in prison reform. Um, so... That, I'm not sure what your exact question was now. I forgot. Oh, how you landed the Ted Bundy. Okay. okay. So um, after working for the governor for um, two years or three, I wanted to get back into the defense side of things. And so I took a job as the public de a, a public defender in Seattle. Then within six months, I was made the chief trial attorney, which was amazing to me because I was clearly not as experienced as some of the other attorneys. 
But um, and I think that created some problems because there's some really gifted lawyers working for them. me. And gifted lawyers are often difficult to administer. Uh, and so um, anyway, in those days, King County would assign public defenders to people who were being investigated. Uh, you didn't have to be charged. And that still happens to a certain extent, but not as much. So I didn't really know all that much about Ted Bundy. He had been arrested in Utah, and the newspapers were saying, you know, is the Utah Ted, the Seattle Ted? So <clears throat> we got an assignment from the Office of Public Defense, which is a county agency, to provide him advice, because he was on bail from Utah. And I have theories about that, by the way, why he was on bail. But so two things happened. They, they assigned us the case, and I did all the assignments in the office, uh, and I assigned it to myself not because of what I thought it would become, um, but because I was a hard worker, I was single, and I knew there'd be a lot of work to this, and I knew that he wanted to meet with somebody on a Saturday. And then at the same time, two lawyers, uh, one of whom is a judge now, a very well-known judge, but doesn't want me to associate with this, um, him with this, um, they worked for the governor also, and they knew Ted from the com campaign. Uh, Ted was working as a gopher, on the Evans campaign at one point, and trying to pretend he was a big deal. And so they called me and told me about it, and they said, do you think you could help Ted? And I said, well, sure. That, and, and coincidentally, we'd just been assigned the case. Um, so that's how I became his lawyer when, when I was 29 years old, I think. Didn't you <clears throat> find out later that it was actually he that had a major hand in selecting you? Yes, but I didn't find that out until much later. And that really creeped me out when I found that out. Because um, uh, he never mentioned that he knew about the fact that my girlfriend had been murdered in Oakland, Berkeley. She was going to Berkeley in graduate school. And um, I didn't know he knew that. And later on, five or six years after, Ted and I had a conversation in the Miami jail cell where he told me he knew about that before he contacted me. And... Um, now we know, we didn't know then, and I don't, didn't know then, um, that Ted was active in Northern California um, during the time that Debbie was killed, basically. And she certainly fit the profile of the women he would uh, um, murder. Um, but the police in Oakland uh, have still not solved that case, and I do not think it fits the profile, really, that much of Ted. So... Um, and that has been a dilemma for me my whole career because I think I'm a fairly zealous defense lawyer, but at the same time, I've also been the victim of a murder, um, which has always, I think, made my approach to what I do different probably than others. Um, so, yeah, he knew about that. And the murder of your girlfriend affected you in, in obviously multiple fr profound ways, but one of them was to change your outlook on capital punishment at that time? Correct. Um, I was raised by a family that was um, quite progressive, really. Um, my dad did change, get a little more conservative as he got older, which I guess happens to many people, but not me. Um, and so I was kind of anti-death penalty. It never made any sense, you know. Don't, thou shalt not kill, but if you kill, we're going to kill you. I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. And so I was always anti-death penalty, as was Debbie. Debbie was very active in uh, politics at Berkeley and uh, working at a halfway house at the time she was murdered. She was working at the halfway house as a volunteer. Um, and she was anti-death penalty. So, I, but when she died, I basically said, you know, if I could catch this guy, I'd rip him apart slowly, uh, one piece at a time. And so I became a believer in the death penalty. And then, I, I know this sounds weird for a lawyer, but. When I was in graduate school in Chicago, I had this very powerful dream. I don't really have that many dreams that I remember, but this one was so powerful it woke me up out of my sleep. And I, um, Debbie came to me in the dream and said, don't honor me by believing in things I never believed in. And very, it was powerful enough that I woke, I woke up. I thought she was in the room, basically. Uh, and I know that sounds strange, but because I don't normally do that. But... Um, and then I started thinking about it, and, and she was right. So I thought it was kind of her way of communicating with me to become anti-death penalty again and work on it um, as a, a goal, as, as trying to save people from the death penalty. So what did you think of Ted Bundy um, when you started dealing with him? Did he creep you out then? 
Not immediately. Uh, he kind of um, he was kind of a caricature of a uh, preppy uh, Ivy League person, and I think that's what he wanted to come off as. You know, his when I was in school at Colorado, there were a lot of preppies and a lot of wealthy um, uh, East Coast people, and clearly Ted was trying to pretend like he was one of those, and so he was wearing you know bass Weegian loafers, you know, penny loafers, and he was wearing corduroys and a turtleneck and clearly trying to um, pass himself off as an establishment sort of person. Um, I, I've always find that creepy, you know? <laughs> but um, in any event, um, uh, I didn't buy his shtick at all, um, although at the, in, the, in the beginning there was actually very little real evidence against Ted. Uh, there was a huge task force, the TED task force, which was actually larger than the Green River task force, and some of the same people. Um, but so, you know, being a defense lawyer, I question the government all the time, uh, and if not uh, more now than then. Um, so, you know, I just didn't assume he was guilty or anything, but that didn't last very long. And um, the circumstantial evidence became so overwhelming to me that probably within the first six months of representing Ted, I was representing him, I was his actual lawyer here in, in Washington, then became his lawyer or legal advisor in Colorado and Florida. Um, and I think within six months I knew he was the Ted, uh, which he finally confessed to me um, uh, in Utah when he was in the prison, uh, which they call the point of the mountain in, in Salt Lake. And I happened to actually be visiting Ted um, the day that Gary Gilmore was executed, which was quite an experience in and of itself because I didn't realize that and I had made my plane reservation and I get to the prison thinking it was going to be just empty and, and there's clamshells and TV people from all over the world. And so, uh, and I realized if there were going to be more bodies found in Utah, um, Ted would definitely be charged with a death penalty um, and probably in Colorado and uh, certainly, Washington's death penalty at the time was unconstitutional, but um, so um, anyway, that, that's how I ended up in, in that conversation. That's the first time he admitted to me that he had done these things. I should also say, by the way, that he's given me, he gave me a release, a written release to talk about uh, attorney-client matters. Um, so that's why I can go into detail about Ted. At the moment when he admitted to you that um, bas that he was guilty, um, did that cause you to reevaluate your whole being a, a defense attorney? Is that something that comes <clears throat> up semi regularly or not at all? Or <laughs> I probably question it <clears throat> every day in one way or another because it's it is one of the hardest jobs I think there is, um, and. Uh, it's very glamorized on television, things, you know, the defense lawyer and the Ferrari and going to the Riviera and having beautiful girlfriends and all that. I did have some beautiful girl girlfriends, and I did go through a period of fancy cars and motorcycles and everything, but it was miserable when that was all happening. But um, it, it, um, since I figured out within six months that Ted was um, guilty, uh, when he told me, it was certainly no surprise. So. And... <clears throat> Can you talk about when you uh, got a <clears throat> a phone call from him when I believe he was in jail in Florida and they didn't know um, who they had at the time? Yes, probably one of the most difficult evenings of my life. Um, and I still question um, what I did and didn't do, um, but fortunately it turned out okay. Um, uh, I was sitting in my office in Pioneer Square alone about 7 o'clock at night. I got a call from the answering service to me um, from a Mr. Rosebud in Florida. And the minute I heard that, I knew it was Ted because that was a nickname he liked to use. Um, he also used it in one of his crimes when he passed himself off as an Officer Rosebud. So I knew the phone call was from Ted, and he, of course, escaped twice now, which I still can't believe they let him escape twice. But um, And he was kind of out of his mind in that phone call. and. Uh, I don't know if he'd gone to a little bit of psychosis, which I think would be rare for him, because I think he was a sociopath, not a, not a crazy person, just a sociopath. Um, so <clears throat> they didn't know who he was. They'd arrested him in Florida for basically loitering uh, in a cul-de-sac in his stolen Volkswagen 
uh, at three o'clock in the morning, and he um, got caught by like a three hundred pound, clearly very overweight police officer who Ted could have outrun in, in a minute. So it's always been interesting to me. I think Ted had a certain death wish. Um, Ted was in the best shape of himself uh, in his life. I'm sorry because he escaped from the jail in Colorado just. 14 or 15 days before that, and he had been working out when he was in Colorado to get small enough to go through that ventilation grate. You can't believe these people were stupid enough to put Ted Bundy in a jail cell that had a ventilation grate in it. So um, the dilemma for me was, is they didn't know who he was. They thought he was Mr. Rosebud. Um, and I realized if he ever got out of custody again, he would kill again, no question about it. Um, so, um, I wanted to turn, call the authorities and tell them, but under the attorney-client privilege, you really can't do things like that. Um, although that's debatable. But um, so, um, I almost I did pick up the phone to call the task force, but I never talked to them. Um, fortunately, um, f for people who could have been victimized by Ted, um, by the morning they found out who he was. Um, so uh, I. Uh, but it was a real dilemma for me because if he had escaped, <clears throat> excuse me, if they'd let him go, which I'm sure they would have for loitering, um, he, he would have killed more people. So, and <clears throat> that uh, that decision was debatable um, in your mind because, as an attorney, um, you are allowed to turn them in only if there's like they're going to do a heinous crime um, immediately or imminently. Right, but it's so subjective. Um, you've obviously done your homework. Um, yeah, um, it's, it's like a psychiatrist or a psychologist in that um, you can't turn your clients in for something unless you're almost certain they're going to commit another crime. You know, and usually the, they require that there are some specifics, like you know, on Tuesday I'm going to go buy a gun and kill somebody on Wednesday. Um, so it's, it's a bit subjective as to how you deal with that. Um, I did call some of my friends including um, one of the brilliant lawyers I worked with in Chicago when I was in graduate school, who is now a federal judge, a retired federal judge, but one of the best in the United States for a while. And Warren Wolfson was his name. And I called Warren, and I think it must have been 10 o'clock in the night in Chicago. And Ted and Warren said, you know, unless you're certain he's going to commit another crime, you really can't turn him in. Um, and so that was really tough. As a matter of fact, I... That on another occasion, um, prior to that, um, I actually thought this job was too hard and I didn't really want to do it anymore. And I started thinking of all the darkness in uh, my world. Um, and so um, that evening, if, he had, if they'd have released him and he'd killed more people, I probably would have quit being a lawyer because I would have felt responsible for that. And I still feel responsible to a certain extent for his escape the second time. Because I was the one that got him special privileges at the jail in Glenwood Springs, and basically, um, and then there was another occasion where I really questioned uh, doing what I was doing. That was the time when I was in the jail cell with Ted in Tallahassee, and uh, been working with him for three or four hours, and uh, he told me that the reason I'd been his legal advisor and lawyer for so many years because he kept firing all his public defenders and everything was um, because we were so much alike. And I almost threw up on the spot, and I was young. You know, he and, he, he and I were only one month apart age-wise. Um, and I went back to this cheap hotel room in Tallahassee where I was staying, and I think I smoked three cigarettes at a time or something, and I looked in the mirror. It was, all I remember is smoke covered and cracked, and I just said, what are you doing here? What, you know, what are you doing trying to help this uh, truly evil person? Uh, and then I also kind of that same night, why are you doing this job? Because, you know, it's too dark um, and depressing. Um, so I almost, uh, as a result of that, because I was so upset that he would think that. I mean, you know, there's no way I would think we were alike. Um, but the fact that he thought we were really bothered me a lot. And... So I, I almost turned the corner and became a shoe salesman at Nordstrom or something, you know. What convinced you to keep going? Um, as I said, um, 
to you earlier was, was it's my path. Um, it's not romantic. Um, it's not. It's really hard, and it is dealing with. I mean, there. I, well, I want to emphasize on uh, um, that there are innocent people convicted, unfortunately, all the time, and I represent a lot of innocent people. Um, the government's own statistics, uh, government statistics, say that approximately five percent of the people in prison are probably innocent. In Washington State, that translates to 900 people who are in prison who are most likely innocent, which I believe is true. So that kept me going because, you know, that's, um, I'm definitely a believer in uh, liberty and freedom. And, you know, standing between an individual and the government uh, is a really important job. And so that kept me going. And you look at today with so many people being let out of both prison and off of death row as evidence comes forward that they were never, clearly never uh, guilty. Absolutely. Um, Governor Ryan in Illinois, who unfortunately got into some legal trouble himself after a while, uh, conservative Republican governor of Illinois, and I believe it was uh, late 90s or early 2000s, I had a study done of the people on death row in Illinois, and it was proven like 13 out of 24 were proven innocent by DNA. And um, I know people who were pro-death penalty that when that study came out, changed their mind uh, and became anti-death penalty. Because you know, that's a horrendous number, a percentage of people. Um, so you know, it, it's really important for people and people listening to this program to know that um, innocent people are charged all the time and innocent people are convicted certainly more than they should be. So that's what kept me going. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, mm -hmm. I thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Oh, you're welcome. Actually, I'm very honored. Thank you.